So I came home, and unfortunately, that wasn't enough because what happened was we have in our compound we have sort of like a, a guest house, and so I was in the guest house. So again, I'm isolated. I can do whatever I want. You know, I had people coming in and dropping off drugs. You know, and what what the last straw was is because I was waking up in the morning and I was drinking. I started to feel like a little almost like muscle cramps around my liver area and then that's when's like yeah okay and welcome to the AdSense Show. My name is Chepto Boyle, and today we have another amazing actor. His name is Kevin Samuel Bugwa. He is an actor, a musician, and... and anything we can add on the title? A research psychologist mm -hmm. and a dad. Oh, oh, congratulations. Thank you. Welcome to the show, Kevin. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Let's start with your background. Okay. Uh, tell us where you grew up and the schools you went to. Right. In the beginning, um, I, I was born in Mombasa in October of 1980. Um, I went to, uh, there's a bunch of preschools, but I guess my first proper school was the Loretta Convent, Mombasa. And I was there till uh, class eight, finished class eight. And then for a very brief time, brief and tumultuous time, I went to Dagoretti High. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was an ordeal. And then I moved back to Mombasa and I went to what essentially the equivalent of Aga Khan Academy. Um, finished that, went to USIU. And then when I was in USIU, I got a scholarship to go to the US in Atlanta. I was there for a year. Then I got another scholarship to go to Boston. That's when I went to Berkeley College of Music. So then I was there. And then after that is sort of when I came back here and started my career in entertainment. Initially in the field of publishing, I was part of the team that started Adam Magazine. Ah. Yeah, very proud of Good that. Man. It was a great magazine. And then after that, that's when I got into uh, the television and film. Mm. Yeah. When you say publishing, were, were you like behind the scenes kind of editors and all that or were you among the writers i was the style editor so any shoot to do with fashion or photographing like you know the women of the month or uh writing articles about health and fitness things like that i was the one responsible for that yeah yeah cool. loved that job it was a great job what would you say is your best or awesome memorable school moments um i think the one that stands out is the first time i was cast as a lead in a play which it was sort of a foretelling of what i'd do in my future but i was cast it was a very strange role i was cast as an italian blind beggar and i remember very particularly you know back in those days when you're doing um stage shows in primary school um, the idea of what they think a stage show should be is very elementary. So they figured they had to put makeup on me to stand out. But the makeup they put was very absurd because they put a lot of rouge and lipstick. I don't know why a blind beggar <laughs> from I Italy... I was trying to get the white aspect more. Maybe, maybe. So, yeah, I remember that. It's a funny memory, but it, it sort of stands out and it, it was very telling about my future, I think. Yeah. So between music, acting, and now investment banking, which one came first? Music. Um, I started music when I was really early. Um, there was a piano in our house growing up. My sister used to play piano. And then... Which one? Was it Janet? Oh, Sharon, my elder sister. Yeah. And so those were the days where TV used to start at four o'clock in the afternoon. I don't know if you remember those days. Yes, I yeah. do. My, my dad had a big padlock on his, <laughs> <laughs> on his wow. cardboard. And only wow. him could open the TV after a while. <laughs> <laughs> what a legend. Um, yeah, and so it used to start with the national anthem. And that's what I learned how to play first. And so 
After that, I went to music class and then I got my own keyboard and I started making my own music. So music was from that point always a part of my life. But what's interesting is between the point I started getting to music until recently, before I got into music, I was interested in, in being a doctor. I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be in health. So what's interesting now is that my life has come full circle and I'm going into the health field. So it's interesting how, how that happens. How one ident- you, you set one identity for yourself that's so strong and then eventually when you're prepared to let it go, you can find yourself again. Yeah. yeah. Last EP was 2011. Was it? Yeah, yes. yeah, okay. <laughs> I can't remember. I went to Apple and I found it. <laughs> Thank you for your support. Will you be going back to music? Ah, oh, this is a great question. I'll tell you what. Um, when I finish doing the series that I'm shooting right now, actually, I think my last shoot day is tomorrow or Sunday, I'm going to go back into the studio just to see what comes up. You know, it's been such a long time. The last time I actually ever released a single, I released a single in 2017 called Unbreakable. I didn't really release it in a large scale. So I'm curious to see what comes out of it. Um, I wouldn't necessarily commit to doing anything. I feel like right now, if I was to do something musical, it would sort of be very personal. Like, here's one thing I want to do. I feel like I want to make a, an anthem to motivate myself to work out, right? So I figure, look, if, if I make an anthem that can get me up in the morning and get me to put on my sneakers and go running, maybe it'll be able to help other people. So that's how I'm approaching it. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. We're waiting for the anthem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll let you know. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about investment banking. Yeah. You did it for a while. Yes, I did. And while you're at the peak, you decided that is not for you. Yeah. Why make that decision? I think... Fundamentally, I was really missing an avenue for creative expression because it's a very it's a very technically demanding job. It's a very what you would call a left brain analytical number crunching um, kind of job, which was good for me because I at some point in my high school I sort of started really struggling with with technical subjects like math and physics and. After that, I sort of always had a complex and just didn't feel like I was good enough when it came to that. So it was important for me to do that, um, to prove to myself that I can do it. And funny enough, right now, what I'm trying to get into is uh, data science and computer programming, which kind of also takes the same kind of skills, right? It's, it's very logical. It's very sequential. You have to get very good with numbers and statistics. So at that time, I had done finance, and you know, I was much younger than I am now. It was ten years ago, but I was missing like doing something creative. And then eventually, when the TV shows started coming on board, I kind of had to decide. I did both at some time. I did both, but then at some point, I was comfortable enough that I could just make the jump into entertainment. Yeah. You didn't have any doubt that if. Now entertainment doesn't work. Yeah. You, you have to go back to what you don't like. I guess I didn't really think about that. You know, the, the beauty of being young is sometimes you get to be maybe a bit too bold. Thankfully, it worked out. But I just felt, um, you know, unless I had the opportunity to say, maybe move, maybe try, uh, you know, maybe South Africa or, or somewhere in Europe and try working in investment banking there, I felt like right now what I need is a creative outlet, you know? So, yeah, it was it was a strange time. It was a very highly demanding job, and the stakes are always very high. You're dealing with high net worth individuals. You're trying to advise them on how to invest. If the stock market just takes one little dip, you're getting calls on end, like you are the person manipulating the stock price. So it was very high pressure, and I was, you know, relatively young at the time so i'm just like uh i don't know how much of this headache i want to deal with right now i did it for just the right amount of time i feel which is how many years i did it for four years yeah four to five years yeah mm. your changes yeah mali yeah what trust did you now to act in um i was at a party once um at that time i was doing a lot of live performing of my music and I met someone 
who was a casting agent. And she just asked me, she's like, have you ever thought of being in TV? And I really hadn't. I mean, I'd acted before. When I went to college in Atlanta, I, I acted in a stage play, but I never thought of it. So she said, here's a number, call. And so I called the next day, went to the audition, and I was cast for the role, cast as the role of, of uh, Kuta in Changes. And then that's just kind of how it took off. So it was really happenstance that I happened to be in one place and someone was like, have you thought about TV? I never would have thought about it. Never. Yeah, which is really funny. Yeah, it's like, you know, sometimes it's important to li listen to the voices of other people because sometimes people see something in you that you don't see in yourself. And it was one of those moments. I would never, I was like, me, TV show? Nah, no one's going to want to watch me in a TV show. <laughs> but then here we are. Yeah. You're also on Crime and Justice. Yes. Tell us more about that role you played. Yeah, um, I played I played a, you know, Crime and Justice is interesting because every single episode you've got a new cast. So I played a lawyer who is, who's, um employee has been killed and so he's one of the people who the two detectives come to to interview and and it's a very contentious thing you can tell he's a lawyer who doesn't like cops and so he really kind of like gently and subtly insults them and asks them to get out of his uh office but it was nice because that was kind of like my foot back into the door because i'm like i would like to try coming back and doing one more thing so when i tried crime and justice i was like you know what this feels right this feels right so Maybe I can do like one big series. And I don't know why I was so confident that something was going to happen. It was very bizarre. I was just like, I, like, I feel like it's around the corner. And then I met a really cool lady called Michelle Tiren. We were shooting um, a, an audio commercial together. And she gave me the contact of a few casting agents, which is something we'll get to because I think for people who want to get into acting... It's very important to get to know who the casting agents are because we don't we don't have talent agents really, but we have casting agents. So she got me in touch with a few, and one of them was our good friend Isaiah, and he he got me to audition for this role for Igiza. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now Igiza, yes, you play Reggie. Yes, Reggie Mosila. Who is this shady businessman? <laughs> <laughs> He's a shady dude, yeah. What do you like about that role, or hate about the role? Mm, about the role, I like that it was. A f I decided that I wanted to not have any vanity about the role. Meaning, when I played characters like Richard Mali, he was very much a leading man, right? So he was positioned as someone who the ladies would like. And with Reggie, I decided I'm just going to be a character actor. I decided. Consciously, like, I want to, because Reggie as a character is probably mid-40, so he's a bit older than me. So I said I wanted to look a bit, you know, babaish, so I put on a bit of weight and wore clothes that were a little baggier. And so I, I didn't have any vanity about it. It wasn't about me, like, trying to be as sexy as possible. I'm just like, I want to be honest and and try and picture most guys in their mid-40s in Nairobi who probably go out and drink too much and eat unhealthily and are only interested in chasing money. And they have a certain look about them. You know, there's a certain heaviness. The eggs uh, in Nairobi. There you go. So that's what I was trying to go for, which has been very bizarre mm -hmm. to like try and alter my appearance because I've always wanted to do that for for uh, film or TV because I some of the actors I really like, I've seen do that, you know, change their appearance. So once this is done, now I'm back to like dieting and hitting the treadmill and everything like that. So... You know, I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it for sure. But they say gaining it is not the issue. Losing it. Yeah, but you know, the thing is, you have to be smart about it. Because initially, it was all like, I'll have whatever. You know, I'll have KFC, I'll have this one. And eventually, you want to stay away from things that are sort of like high in salt, which is a lot of fast food. So basically, what I do now <laughs> is like, I'll eat like a massive pile of like broccoli and cauliflower. So it's like healthy food, but I eat a lot of it like throughout the day. <laughs> So it'll be slightly easier when I want to now adjust my weight back down is that now I just continue to eat responsibly, but just in 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 in, in smaller portions and also to space it out during the day because there's this thing called intermittent fasting that I try sometimes and it's really useful. Times when I eat, when I don't eat for like, 
you know, what they do, intermittent fasting is you eat, say, between 12 noon and 8 o'clock, for example, and then you don't eat anything until the next 12 o'clock. So it's two meals, like... Yeah, you can eat even three, as long as it's... 12, yeah, eight. it's exactly. And then nothing now until 12 again. And it's supposed to be really healthy in terms of... It, it puts less strain on your body. Because every time you eat, obviously, your body has to... Wild. Exactly. So, yeah, I'm looking to go into all of that. And as someone who's going to be studying public health, that's something I'm very interested in, is physical health and and to try and get people to also be at their peak in terms of their physical health. It's very important to me. Yeah. Your character, Reggie, yeah. uh, most of the scenes you're with, your script wife, mm -hmm. Sarah Danu, yes. who is double-casted as Linda and Nicole. Talk about a tough job. Do you confuse them sometimes? <laughs> no, thankfully, <laughs> <laughs> thankfully, um, when I get to set, um, we already know what we're shooting. And the good thing about the way Sarah plays um, Nicole and Linda is that she has very distinct, just like resting face, facial positions. Not even like, forget even the acting of the characters, just the way her face rests. She's, Sarah is very particular about the way she works. So when she comes out of the changing room, even if I didn't know who I was shooting with, I'm like, oh, okay, I'm shooting with Nicole. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really I did. Yeah, yeah. She, she, has, she has a way that her face rests when she's Nicole and she has a way that her face rests when she's Linda. So you can tell she's put a lot of work into it. I mean, by the time you can tell the characters difference just by the way their faces without speaking, you know they've put in a lot of work. Yeah, for sure. Last time we spoke, you said, this is your last series. Yes. And then you retire. Yes. Which I objected. <laughs> and I'm still objecting. So sorry. So sorry. <laughs> yeah. What if the series is picked for season two, uh, three or more? What will happen? Yeah, okay, first of all, the series is, it's a limited series. So, yeah, so Igiza will only happen as this one, one thing of 13 episodes. Yeah, yeah, so that's, that's the first very important one, because you never know who's going to die. That's another thing. That's the problem with limited series. That's the problem it with moves very fast. Yes, it's, oh man, it moves so fast. And there'll be moments in the series that are going to really shock people. I liken it to... Um, you know, people who are fans of, of Game of Thrones, there's an episode, I can't remember what season it is in, called uh, Red Wedding, where, like, a whole bunch of people died. Actually, season one, the whole family freaking died. You know, when, I was a fan. When Ned uh, Stark, like, when they killed Ned at Star Ed at Stark, I was like, no, this can't be. There's there's moments in this series that are like that, where, like... It's more like Shonda Rhimes kind of vibe. Yeah. Uh, you could die, but you could also die like violently. Like we've we brought in a team of, of special effects guys so that you know in, in when you're watching a TV show or a film and when someone gets shot and you see the pop and the you know like the gory yeah. Yeah. So that's what we've done. So like I haven't seen any local shows that have done that. But it's where like when you see a guy get shot, you really looks like a guy's getting shot. Yeah, so that's mainly the reason why I wouldn't be coming back because it's only it's only a limited series, and I really do feel like it's time for me to to move on to this new phase of my life where the work that I want to do has a lot to do with people living a healthy life and making healthy life choices. Um, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about your personal life. Yes, you opened up about battling alcoholism and drug abuse. Yes, how did it start? Um, let's see, I guess when it comes to alcohol, it starts very casually as you are when you're a teenager and you have a drink with your friends and the beer tastes gross and everybody's like, yeah, you'll toughen up, which is a very funny thing in our culture. If you think about it, where you taste alcohol for the first time and it tastes terrible, but the, guys are guys. yeah, the insinuation is that you need to man up and do it. You see? So already that, if you think about that, there's something twisted about that. But I don't think it really became a problem until the last few years when I was in France, um, which was just, it was an awful time, just culturally and personally. And it was just something, honestly, it's because it got harder to get the drugs. Um, it got harder to get the drugs, so then it was just like an immediate substitute. Whereas when I was here, it was so easy to get ecstasy or cocaine. Um, it was like... 
marijuana. It was so easy to get there. So the alcohol kicked in when I couldn't really get anything. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd go into like the, yeah, since you said you don't mind oversharing. Um, I'd go into these, there's, there's parts of Paris that are sort of like, they're called the African quarters where you'll see, like, it's like a whole street and it's just Senegalese, Malian shops, hairdressers and things like that. So I used to go there thinking, these are my guys. They'd help me out. But what I realized is uh, sometimes th the people who you get a lot of problems with in France are not necessarily the white people. It's the West Africans. Because there's this sort of, like, there's this sort of dislike I found for East Africans. Mm. Or rather for Anglophones. Uh, yeah, yeah, it felt very... Very, very palpable. Um, and I've talked to other Anglo Anglophones who've lived in France and they say it's the same thing. Sometimes it's worse. Sometimes it's worse. There's this like... There's no enough. Oh, no, gosh, no, no. And I don't know what that is. I don't know what it is. You know, when I think, when I compare, I feel like we are generally more confident. We're generally more outspoken. I realize this because there was a job that I had there, I remember... And I was brought in to sit and work on the board. And I remember there was one board member who was like an elderly um, white guy. And he, he would say live, he's like, I don't know what this guy is doing at our table. Because to them, it was strange for them to see like this guy show up and be confident and not like placate himself. And like, whereas you see a lot of And times, not mess up at the same time. And not mess up at the same time. But you see there in the culture, it's very different the way it is. I mean... I could get into a whole critique about life in France, but... Because I'm thinking yeah. the, the crop of uh, Francophone guys mm. who struggle to go to France, mm. they're not necessarily educated over the cream yeah, guys. Very they true. just want to go and survive and make something. Very themselves. true, very true. Hence the hit. Very true. And and also when when people come across you and you're not one of those guys, then they don't know how to deal with you. They don't know how to handle it because they expect exactly what you're saying. Someone to show up and be very sort of like, um, almost like overly timid and just expecting a handout and not being very engaged. So I found that like when I was going to try and get my hashish from these guys, they didn't want anything to do with me. So I guess... <laughs> they didn't know where to put you. <laughs> they didn't know where to put Are me. you with them or so, with us? Exactly. So I ended up just drinking a lot of alcohol, which is terrible. A terrible thing to get into yeah so that's when it got really bad and then i came back in 2019 to to get get sober yeah mm. uh before you came back yeah. did, while you're doing it in kenya did your family members either realize that mm. you're into drugs or alcoholism no had they had no idea they had no idea i mean part of my ability to be a good actor on screen is that i was a good actor in real life you know like you it's amazing because now we talk about it and i'm like remember that time and they were like really you were high i was like i was so high you have no idea and they're like they couldn't tell so you learn you, it's a coping thing as a as an addict it's like you know that you have to be a certain way around people so that you can maintain the illusion and so i knew exactly what amount of threshold that i could consume i knew i couldn't go over the limit because you know Someone might just see something or I might slip and say something. So I always had to, it's really like self-medication. You have to decide how many, what dose you're going to take before you meet certain people. And then the people who I used to get high with, I used to show up and I'd be plastered, you know, because the one time misery loves like company. You. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, what signs should family mm. or friends watch out for? Oh, wow. Wow. Like simple stuff that guys do, guys who are on drugs or are dealing with alcoholism are doing, but we overlook them. Mm. Gosh, that is such a good question and interesting. I've never thought about that. Let me see. Like rat out through your signs that you're hiding. Um, I think one of the things is I, I just definitely, I was kind of like a very, I was very hidden. So they wouldn't see me much. So I guess one of the things is like if you've had generally, you know, if you've had generally good, um, what's the word, a good amount of interaction, and then all of a sudden that gets quiet, that could be a sign. Because when you start self-medicating, 
there's usually a reason behind it it could be a personal tragedy it could be just maybe an an instance of loss of confidence cuz something didn't work out so what you're trying to do is you're basically trying to heal your wound and you feel like nobody else can understand the depth of this wound only i can and so only i can heal this wound and when you tell yourself that then it goes like okay if only i can heal this wound like what skills do i have to do it i don't so let me just try and make myself feel better boom there you go that's how the cycle starts and so you start to you do start to feel better so you feel like you're healing the wound but all you're doing is like constantly Even thinking more there's that but then also what you re- what you're doing is you're just delaying the discomfort until you know you're just putting it here and then coming here and putting it here and that that's that is drug moving abuse. around that's drug abuse it's like taking your problems moving them slightly so you hear it's like ah oh, no problem and then suddenly you you're here and then like okay i need to move it again so drug is uh, a a drug user is constantly just shifting their their problems forward and forward and forward and forward yeah so what event or thing happened to you mm. that that you decided you know what enough is enough i need to go back home and get myself clean get myself clean mm. did you have an event or a moment where you say ah, this is my rock bottom i need to go get well there were two there was the moment where i decided i need to leave france and come here and then when i came here unfortunately i hadn't immediately decided that i was going to get clean so i continued so the first moment was in france i was i i had a company there and i was work, i had three different i had two different clients and then i was part of a startup that was in london so i'm basically i'm lecturing at a university in paris and then i'm going to work at this company which was uh, it was actually a financial institution so i did a bit of work with them and then i would take a train from paris to london and i'd be working on a startup like I was overworking. Yeah, and you know it's only because I was completely under the influence that I even thought that I could handle that. You know when you when you're high there's this thing where everything seems possible. So like there's this feeling of like you know I can handle everything. I think about it now I was like dude you had three jobs. You had three jobs and one was in another city. Like what were you thinking? So another I country. another country. Yeah. <laughs> crossing national borders to go to to go to work. So I snapped. I just I just snapped and I remember calling my family and said like I I need to come home. So I came home and unfortunately that wasn't enough because what happened was we have in our compound we have sort of like a um guest house. And so I was in the guest house. So again, I'm isolated. I can do whatever I want. You know, I had people coming in and dropping off drugs, you know. And what what the last straw was is because I was waking up in the morning and I was drinking. I started to feel like a little almost like muscle cramps around my liver area. And then that's when's like, yeah, okay. All right. You just realize mm. you're going down mm. from here. This is not good. It's funny that, you know, all the signs that your brain is trying to tell you sometimes aren't enough until your body's like, okay, this is what you're doing. And then it was at that point I was just like, oh, so like I'm actually killing myself. Right. Okay. So I called It's funny because I had broached the subject with my family about wanting to get better. And that's another thing you have to realize about addicts. A lot of addicts want to get better. It's just they don't know how to make that connection. So this is what I did and this might help someone. I was in Mombasa. What I did was I called the Aga Khan Hospital in Nairobi. I called them. They said, "Hello, how can I help you?" I said, "Look, I'm I'm an addict. I'm starting to have thoughts of self-harm, which I was." I'm like, "Could you put me in touch with someone?" So they put me in touch with someone. His name was Tim. I always remember it because my brother's name is Tim and he said what's going on and i told him and he says okay what would you like me to do and this was the important part i said call my father explain it to him because there's there's a d- detachment that comes with someone else especially a medical professional saying your son has called me this is what he's going through this is what i advise they'll take it too serious that next morning i was on a plane with my dad came to nairobi saw a psychiatrist went into detox for a few days 
and then went to rehab for close to a month. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Yeah. What's the hardest thing of staying sober? Because the last time I was with you, you on ginger ale. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's my jam now. Yeah, on ginger ale. The hardest thing about staying sober, I think it's, I really have to speak only for myself. I think there's, uh, there's different experiences for people. Initially, it was a sense of having a drink around certain people was part of my identity. So initially, what was really hard was like, it's like I have to shed my my circle. And by shedding my circle, I feel like I'm, it feels like you are having to kill off a part of yourself. That's what the hardest thing is. But it's interesting because what happens is if you just continue with it, you'll notice that that part of yourself dies off naturally, including all the people who loved that person. So all the people who I used to get drunk with, you know, nobody got in touch with me. And I understood and I didn't feel any which way about it. But it it shows you that when you're an addict, you have to remember that that's not all of you. That's a part, part of you. Part of that's a yeah. part of you. And it's a small part. It is. It is. If you really put it into perspective, the fact that you just the fact that you're alive and breathing means that somehow the rest of you is keeping you alive, but you have this one thing that's like an anchor. So if you just continue focusing on this major part, you're, you're not feeding this thing anymore. You're not feeding this little thing. And if you don't feed it, it dies. So, yeah. So the hard thing is, is knowing that there's a part of you that's going to die. For most people hearing that, that's very scary. So that's difficult. And also you lose majority of your drinking friends. Absolutely. If not all of them, you do. Yeah, yeah. I mean... I, I'm not in touch with anyone who I used to call a friend, so to speak. You know, now the people in my life that I have chosen to be in my life are, are very different. A lot of them are, interestingly enough, the people I've bonded with now are a lot, lot more mature than me. Like my closest, I would say like my closest acquaintance is he's 72, 73. Like I have the most meaningful conversations with him. And these are people who are generally quite spiritual and philosophical. And so I don't miss that old set of friends. Because when you're sober, and this is another very important thing, in whatever relationships you're talking about, what happens when you're an addict in a relationship, in any kind of relationship that's dysfunctional, what you realize when you get sober is that when you're sober, what you focus on more with people are the differences that you have Whereas when you're an addict, you're trying to focus too much on the similarities. And the reason you're doing that is because you, you're so desperate to have someone who fee, fits in and understands and understands your misery and everything like that. Whereas when you're sober now, you look at that relationship, you're like, yeah, we had similarities, but my goodness, the differences. It's like a five to one ratio. But you still appreciate it. Absolutely, you do. You, you, you either have to upgrade. Yeah, yeah. Or they'll beat you. <laughs> they'll beat you. <laughs> exactly. But so that's, re that's been really interesting. It's like when you're sober, you're looking at the differences in people. Not to, not to sort of judge them, but to appreciate just how different you are. So that when you do focus on the similarities... It, it's based on a perspective of realism and reality. Because if you're an addict, the person that you have there, you have created them in your mind. It's not really that person. You, you know when people say this very funny line, they weren't who I thought they were. It's like, well, how the hell did you think that they were who you thought? You just thought they were that. You know? Even from your, from your own personal experience. Yeah. Who you are when you're drunk. Yeah. And the next morning. Very different guys. Day and night. <laughs> you don't even want to know who was yes. that at night. Exactly. You don't want to see that person. So that's been very, very uh, enlightening. So you do get a new circle of people who are much healthier and much more grounded. So it's that's the scary part. If you can get over the fear of of the death of that part of you, because everybody has fears around death, if you can get over that, you started you started the journey. Yeah. You also opened up uh, about dealing with depression yeah. uh, to a point where you were contemplating suicide. Yes. Uh, what was the trigger for that? I think when my depression really started is when I moved back from the US to here, 
And I feel like I had really, I had really built a life for myself there. You know, I had uh, a girlfriend and I had this close circle of friends and I was in a place where I was surrounded by musicians. It was really like an ideal bubble. And then I came here and I really came here because I felt like, I'm like the family's here, you know, it's like I need to be a part of things. But that, that gap between those two worlds was so harsh that I just started to feel so lost. I'm just like, I don't feel like I'm of this place. When I talk to people, they're like, you like you belong here. I don't feel like I'm, I belong here. When people talk to me, they say, you sound funny. You've got a funny accent. And it's, I just kept feeling more and more like an alien. And so because of that, the depression makes you now start shutting off or as in my case, start to consume drugs to find other people who and it's so funny that the people who I'd most spend time with were so similar to me there were Kenyans who had lived abroad who had come back and were also feeling depressed there was like there was a moment where there was like they called it a there was a there was a time there was a, a few years where a lot of young Kenyans started to come back because they were trying to find you know you want to reconnect with home and a lot of them started feeling really lost it's like i don't belong here so that's what got me really depressed and I felt like look if I can't get back to the US then what's the point of living really so that's what really got me to be uh, suicidal yeah yeah and then when I was in France um again in the middle of all this thing of trying to work three different jobs and and being a new dad and it's just it became overwhelming and even then I contemplated it but luckily Luckily the furthest I've ever gone is contemplation and and never actually harmed myself. So yeah, but it was it was really real. You just don't feel like there's there's any point. It's like how can I be waking up every day and feeling this miserable? Like how how can this be something that I should just tolerate? I'm like why don't I just end it all? And I've said this before. I said this in the interview I did with my sister. It's like when you are at that point what it means or what I think it means it's like um it's like the caterpillar that's in the cocoon like lava yeah and so what you don't realize is it it, it feels like there's something in you that feels like a death is, death is happening but what that death is is that you're evolving from one person to another and sometimes the, the point of evolution comes where you've reached it's almost like anything else it's like muscle growth like when you go work out the most painful reps you have to do when you're when you're lifting those uh barbells those last few really really painful ones that's where growth is happening or even the next morning after doing the same yes yeah exactly exactly so so i realized what it is is that it's not that i need to kill myself it's that i need to accept that i've come to the end of a particular cycle that's why i'm feeling lost because there's a gap between who i am and who i need to be and i don't know what that is i don't know how to come across it so it's like I don't so if there's no bridge to there then I'm going to be stuck here forever and I don't want to be stuck here forever. So that's what that's when when I realized actually there is a bridge there and what I need to focus on is how to get from there to there. That's what saved me. Wow. Yeah. You met your wife yes. during the audition of Mali? Yes, correct. But you guys were also casted yes. as hus- husband and wife. Oh yeah, yeah as a couple. Yeah, yeah. Uh was the connection during the audition or during the show? No, it was it was actually after. So when we when we auditioned, it was our producer who you know what happens in an audition is you you're paired with different people for different scenes. So I I did a scene with uh Mkamze, I did a scene with Mumbi, uh, I did a scene with Brenda and then I did a scene with with Marilyn and at that point we were just doing the scene and it was after that where the um the producer says I feel like you guys have chemistry I think I should cast you too but we were friends for the longest time uh before we decided to get into a relationship and it's funny now because when we talk about that we feel like we for a long time especially when I was in France and I was going through this really hard time what we needed to do was find a way back to being those people when we when we met exactly and so that's been really helpful for us um because obviously if your partner is going through these suicidal 
um, drug abusing moments, it's also very difficult for you. Strains. Exactly, it strains you quite a bit. So it was really important for us to find that reconnection of us being those two people who met shooting, shooting uh, a, TV a TV series. Exactly. And we have a great kid, really, really great kid that we love to bits, yeah. A boy or a girl? A girl. Her name is Leone, and she's turning five next month. Yeah. Congrats. Thank you. <laughs> the, proudest, the, the proudest moments I've had are just with her and seeing her grow up. She's really cool. What made your wife the one? Oh, um, just felt like the person I could tell everything to. Very, I th And I'm... I know that that's not a very romantic answer, but it's truly just, so that's your best friend. That's a person who you can tell everything to, even like the scary stuff. And that person can do the same for you. And I think that's just it. It's just that. And to this day, we are like that. It's like, that's the person I can share stuff with before I would even share it with my family, sort of thinking. Yeah. Yeah, it's important. It's important. Yeah. Then you guys relocated to yes. Paris. Uh, why make that decision? Um, I think it got to a point where I felt that, you know, she had been here for a very long time. Um, and I know that her family had missed her, especially her mother. I remember when we finally moved back there, <laughs> her mother just like, gave me this huge hug and said, thank you for bringing my daughter back because that had been the thing. So I felt, you know, it was important also for her to be back with her family. You know, she'd been here with my family for so long and I, I felt that it was important. And I know I'm happy we made that decision because while it was a very difficult time for me, she flourished. You know, she was able to find some work that she loved and she was able to reconnect with her sister and her nephews. So it's one of those things where when I, when I look back, you know, I always say we moved for a reason. Maybe for, for me, it was to get to the worst of my self to be able to get clean. Whereas for her, it was to you know reconnect with her family. Mm. Do you see Paris as your ultimate home or is it back and forth Paris and Kenya? Um, yeah, it's always kind of been uh, Paris, Nairobi, London, kind of that, that mix. Um, you know, fundamentally, Paris is because there's family there, fundamentally. I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure that I'd be there otherwise. Uh, no, <laughs> no disrespect to Paris. It's just, a, it's like, to me, the Francophone world is like the upside down of the Anglophone world. It's very interesting. Um, I really like London, especially when you're in Paris. London is like heaven because you feel like, ah, oh, I'm with my people again. You know what <laughs> I mean? It's like we speak the same language we have because we have, we're, we have British Similarity. culture. Exactly. Yeah. So everything feels normal. And then, of course, here, Nairobi, out of everywhere I've been to in the world, there is no place that has better weather than Nairobi. No place. And I think there was an article that actually said that. Nairobi's weather... Honestly, for the weather alone, I would be here. And if if uh, if there was ever talk with the family to relocate here, of course I'd be here. But as long as they're that side, it's important for me to be. It's important for me to be there. And also, it's part of my part of my healing process. And I was I was talking to her about this recently. It's like those those three years were like the hardest years of my life. But I'm not going to let that define my relationship with France because my daughter is French and Kenyan. Yes. But she's French, which means I need to always have a positive relationship with that culture, yeah. right? Because it's very easy. If you have a kid who's of another nationality and you have issues with that nationality, the kid might feel like you have issues with them. Yeah. You see what I mean? You don't like my other side. Exactly. So it's very important for me to get to learn how to appreciate them. And thankfully, I got accepted into this program. It was I, I couldn't believe it when I found out because it's a, it's the French School of Public Health. It's a mass, it's a public health master's program. They only admit like forty people from around the world each year. So when I was I was I realized now that the people who wrote my references because I, I was working with the British government when I was in London um, these last two years, and so the person I worked with must have written me a really good recommendation because it's a really hard school to get into. So I get to go there and focus on this and sort of like now build new relationships with people as a sober person. 
And I think that that's going to help me develop a new relationship with La France. <laughs> yeah. uh, you've just said you're back to school studying public health. Yeah. Why is it? Why is that course very important to you? Because I believe it gives me the tools to start addressing uh, mental health issues on a broad scale. So I did a master's in psychology in London, and that was very useful in understanding just the developmental process, especially for addicts and especially for men who are addicts. But public health now makes you focus on okay, so these are the issues. How do we implement this on a great scale? So you study things like epidemiology. How do disease spread uh, uh, within communities, and um, how do you handle health policy and health management programs? Because without that, all I can really do is you know maybe just have a singular voice talking to people but what i want to be able to do is work with people because if i if i work within a network of professionals who are very good at what they're doing then the effect is much stronger you know and so this also lets you know how health professionals work and how they think and how they what their philosophies are from different parts of the world because if there's anything that covid <laughs> has uh, raised a uh, tortoise It's like we need to start paying attention to our health. It is amazing how everything shut down when we realized our health was at risk. No other time in in the world has everything shut down, but the only thing that made us shut down was when our health was at risk. You know? So, yeah, COVID was definitely part inspiration of that. Mm. You have a famous sister? I do. Janet the best. Mugua. The absolute best. Do you feel bad mm. when guys refer to you as Janet Mugwa's brother? I love it. I love it because here's the funny thing. At some point when she was just starting out on KTN, she used to be Kevin Mugwa's sister. <laughs> so it's really I love it. I love it so much. She was she used to tell me when she was younger. She's like, "Yeah, people don't call me Janet. People call me your sister." And I just think how interesting it is now. Um, no, I don't. I'm I'm I mean, to get to be her older brother is is fantastic. Because you also see like I think back to the times when we were young and the conversations that we had and and how I can see that that informed her personality and I can see it on screen and everybody is seeing it on screen and 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 uh appreciating that. So for me it's great. I'm very happy. To, I feel I feel like I should get a t-shirt that just says Janet Bogus sister, brother rather. Yeah. You know. So yeah, no, I'm very proud to be. Yeah. You are also mm. a judge for TPF Tasca Project. I've done a lot of stuff, huh? <laughs> I'm realizing this now. I have lived. The, the 360 of it I all. Have lived. Yeah. The TPF judging thing, let me tell you, that was so hard. That was so hard because we we auditioned that day um I think we auditioned maybe about 400 people and you know how many we had to choose? How many? Five. We could no. only choose five. So you you want to know what it's like having to say no that many times? It's awful. It was so awful. And I remember I remember the the people who auditioned there was this one girl like she was she was good but she was just just not there. And we had to say no and I remember meeting her like a year after that at some function and I could see that she was still upset about it and I was just like I don't think I want to do that again. It's really difficult like because Some people take it in stride. And then for some people who've grown up and everybody's telling them you're a great singer and you show up and you're on live TV and you don't get chosen. It takes a oh, tough Or even be you you review telling her you you're good but you're just not You're there. just not there. It's like who am I to judge this person, you know? It's I'm a very giving you this but I'm Yeah, exactly. You're pulling it away. It's a very strange position to be in because you you end up being a gatekeeper and luckily the person who won uh that season she auditioned with us and i remember turning to my co-judge and i'm like this one's taking it like I immediately the minute she came in and sang i was just like she's taking it. who was it um she was the daughter of uh abel ruth matete the minute she came in and sang i was just like yeah it's it. this is the winner that's that's the one to beat and i was like i wasn't surprised when she won yeah being a music teacher Mm-hmm. Uh what should we do to improve our local industry? Wow. Because I remember the last time I asked yeah. you this. <laughs> I said how much time do I have? Yeah, we have a bit more time now, right? Yes. Um 
Okay, so let's let's talk specifics. Are you talking about um, how musicians should either work on their craft or work on building themselves in the industry? So start with working their craft mm. and then now building the industry. Yeah. I think what's beautiful about um, the world that we live in now is that everything is interconnected, right? And so you have these really cool websites. I know I think there was one I came across called Splice. Uh, if anyone's into music production, check it out because what it does is that you can do like a small bit and then someone in Estonia can like add to it. And so you end up like building music together. I think it's really, really important, even though most musicians are very sort of like insular and very private, is try a lot in terms of working with stuff, working on stuff with other people. That's number one. Because like I said, musicians tend to be very private. So I think your first hurdle is, if you're going to make it in life as a musician, you're going to have to collaborate anyway. Yeah. Like you're always working in a team. Even at the highest level of it, you have a business manager, finance manager, you have a lawyer, you have an agent, you have a man. You, you're already you're collaborating. So why not get comfortable with collaborating early on? So do some research, find these websites. It's also a great way to build a global community. There are guys now who, like when I, when I did uh, my single in 2017, I was basically doing it virtually, you know, sending it to some guys in France and they'll work on this and they'll come back. And so that's really great. I'd say everybody take time doing that. And by virtue of that, get comfortable with programming and, and like creating your own tracks and things like that. You know, now everything is so affordable. You can just get a, a, a program on your laptop and you can start building tracks so that's that's from the development perspective. From the industry perspective, I think what we need to realize is success looks different for different people. Yeah. You can be nameless, as in the, arch- the artist. <laughs> <laughs> Not the singer. Yeah. Um, you, you can be someone who has um, a huge fan base, someone who has... Um, uh, basically like you know a lot of followers on Instagram and that person has that career or you can be someone who basically is the go-to guy when people need music for commercials or someone who's a go-to guy when people need music for TV shows and I'm thinking STL you remember STL yes she she came out mm. she was re- singing dub Kenyan yeah. stroke international kind of yeah band. yeah and then she went quiet yeah she did didn't she then she released a whole album yeah and most of the programs on Netflix, yeah. when I Shazam, yeah. it's STL. I'm like, how? There you go. How are you? So she's now into composing for scores. There you go. Which I think that is where the money is. That is if absolutely. You're for. Yeah, absolutely where the money is. You, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. So she realized that as much as it's nice to have, you know, the fans and the followers, you can you can be a bit more strategic about it. I think we talked about this last time about how I got to perform for like the presidents. Look at him yeah. perform for the presidents and move moving on. <laughs> <laughs> you performed for the late Daniel Toritich Arab Moy and the late Emilio Moy Kibaki. And and the, his highness the Aga Khan. And received advice from the Grammy winner Alicia Keys. Yeah. That's now that's the proper way. <laughs> <laughs> This is funny because this is like the first like in-depth conversation I'm having and I'm just like, good Lord. Look at all the sectors you've <laughs> done a lot. Yeah. Music. Yeah. Acting. Mm. Investing. Yeah. Ish. And then it's funny because again, it's like I came back to that 11-year-old who was just like, I think I want to be a doctor. Like, I think I want to be in health. And now I'm back in, in, in the health side of things. It's been very interesting. I've been very lucky. Yeah. Someone once told me, as you, the way you're talking about music, don't confuse visibility with success. Oh, that's perfect. I'm like, wow. That's perfect. I never thought of that in yeah. this social media age. Yeah. Do you know who, who the most successful songwriter is? His name is Max Martin. He's a Swedish guy. Very few people know what he looks like. He doesn't give many interviews. But all those pop songs from the 90s by the Backstreet Boys and Britney Spears and NSYNC, he wrote all of them. 
all of them. He even still writes music for Katy Perry for Pink. He has had more number one hits than the Beatles. Nobody knows who he is. Nobody knows. I, I didn't know. Exactly. Until today. Exactly. <laughs> so that's a perfect example of visibility isn't everything. And unfortunately, the world we live in right now is so hooked on visibility, right? We're so hooked on attention. But just focus on trying to be good at building a product and being able to get a fair price for your transaction and also a very interesting don't confuse your worth with your price your worth your worth is different than your price because when when you when you make that separation you can start out humbly and build you see you don't have to feel offended that someone said I'll pay you this much but that that's not your worth that's just your price and your price will improve if you just maintain your worth so that's something important wow yeah hmm. amazing mm-hmm. lastly yes what would you want your legacy to be i would want my legacy to be that i came back from the brink of death and addiction and i was able to shine a light on it in a way that took away shame. I saw this quote and I have it. I write down important quotes and there's a quote that said the antidote to shame is light. And I want to be that person who shines light on what people find shameful. That's why it's so easy for me to talk about this. So I want that to be my legacy. I want to be remembered as the guy who he decided to focus all his energies and all his attention on this particular thing because he felt like it was the most important thing that he could do with his time. you know outside of outside of being a parent yeah yeah may that be my legacy yeah awesome thank you so much for coming it's a pleasure i'll always do interviews with you anytime can you put that thank you guys for watching the episode please subscribe if you don't want to subscribe just watch hit the like button and share see you guys next week thank you thanks so much <laughs>